morning, everybody. Roger has left us no time for a break, so <laughs> and I have been I have been told by an elder that I can go till noon, and he's going to tell the rest of the, the uh, Bible class teachers that, but I won't be offended if you leave at 1145. Uh, so, all right, we... Um, you know, have been doing a Bible overview class. We got through the entire Bible, but today, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we did it, everybody. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but we're going to end on how we got the Bible, uh, which is just an interesting topic. We talked about how obviously we can be uh, faithful and uh, Christians without knowing all this stuff, but it can really help strengthen our faith to understand where did we get this book that we put our faith in, the words of God himself. So first of all, there we go. Um, so uh, I, most of the material that I'm covering today I got from this book, How We Got the Bible by Neil R. Lightfoot. It was incredibly helpful uh, for this topic and everything. So I want to make sure I uh, give him the credit for, for the vast majority of this. Now, when we're talking about how we got the Bible, um, you know, we talked a little bit last time I taught, and thanks to Dave for covering for me when I was sick last week, um, we talked about how we don't have the originals. We don't have the original copy of any book in the Bible. Everything is a copy. And so because of that fact, uh, we need to figure out how do we come up with something definitive when all we have is copies? Right? And that's what the majority of what we're going to talk about today. Um, the most valuable uh, manuscripts that we have are the ones that are, were written in the original language, right? copies from the original language. So for the Old Testament, the Hebrew manuscripts are the most valuable. For the uh, New Testament, the Greek manuscripts are the most valuable. Uh, however, translations are also very helpful uh, because they give us another kind of point of view. They came from something, right? And we may, not, may or may not have what they came from, but we can somewhat derive what they, they came from, you know, as far as the originals go. So translations are also very helpful uh, to us learning, you know, what the original books were. Uh, the two main approaches you can take when you're making an edition of the Bible is either, number one, you pick a manuscript and you translate it. The end. You just, here's a copy of it, you know, hopefully as old as you can get, <laughs> and, and you translate it. But that's not the approach that we typically take because one manuscript uh, could be wrong. Whatever inherent problems, the mis mistranslations or miscopies or whatever, uh, you know, gets just get carried along. So what m we mostly do is we consult a number of different manuscripts and authorities, and then we use a technique called textual criticism to try to use them all to, to find what is most likely what was originally written by the author of that book. Um, and they, they call that the reconstructed or restored approach. And that's the approach that most of our modern texts use. Let's find all the different copies and let's try to reconcile them using the best rules we can. So I'm going to give you a, a few examples of some of the rules that are used in textual criticism, just so you can get a sense of, of how they do this. So um, one is... Uh, you reference as many uh, manuscripts and translations as possible. Number two is um, you look at citations of those books uh, for the Bible. So not everything is just a copy. Not, not, not everything is like, oh, this is the book of Matthew, right? Sometimes you have people who quoted the book of Matthew, right? They're, they're writing some sort of paper, <laughs> some sort of argument, and in their argument they quote you know, the book of Matthew or any other book in the Bible. Um, and so there's this, this man, Professor Bruce Metzger, uh, who is, here's a quote from him. He says, so extensive are these citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> That's how much the, the New Testament was quoted uh, in, in manuscripts that we have today. 
so that even if it's not explicitly a copy, we could still rebuild the New Testament. So a few of those rules for textual criticism. Um, number one, if, if two manuscripts uh, have a difference between them, you should prefer the more difficult reading of the difference. So if one's like, oh, that's really clear, the other one's like, oh, that's a little harder. The reason you prefer the more difficult one is because that's one of the mistakes that, that have been made over, over time, is that if you're going to translate something and you're like, oh, I'm not sure which way this should go, you pick the easier one, like as a human being. You, you want to go with the one that's easier, which means it's more likely that it's been changed from the, what was originally written down. Some things in the Bible are hard, <laughs> right? And some people have tried to erase the hard parts just because it's human nature. Another rule is to prefer the quality of the source of a version, not the quantity of a version. So you might have a later manuscript that's been copied a whole bunch of times, and we have, well, you know, I'm making numbers up, but you know, we have 500 copies of this one, but there's one that's, that's 300 years older. Well, the older one is probably the more accurate one. It was closer to the source of when it was copied. So you would prefer the older manuscript, even though there's more copies of the later manuscript. Um, in parallel texts, what we mean is texts that are the same thing, like the Gospels, right? We're telling this a lot. There's a lot of overlap in the stories, right? In parallel texts, we prefer the variations, not when they're consistent. So if you have manuscripts that, they, oh, these, these three manuscripts, they all match, and in these three you don't. Again, the reason we pick that is because it's human nature to go, well, it, makes more, it would be nicer if they all matched up exactly. So I'm going to pick that. I'm going to, even if the original didn't say that, so it's human nature to erase the original wording if it makes it more consistent. So it's more likely that the original wording was the difference. Um, and then uh, there's, there's, and I'll get into this later, there's various sources of these manuscripts. They can all be categorized, and you want, there, some of the categories of them are more, um, more likely to be right. And so we choose from those manuscripts. And, but I'll go into that more uh, in a little bit. So that's kind of the idea of textual criticism. We take all these manuscripts, we try to find what was the most likely, the true thing that was originally written down, since we don't have the original. Um, so all that being said, I'm going to start talking about uh, the manuscripts we have. <laughs> that, that build that is what we use to constitute the Bible that we have today. Um, so the Old Testament writings were assembled into excess, accepted Old Testament scripture by the time of Ezra, about uh, 400 BC. It was essentially nailed down by that time. A few, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus said that no book was added to the Hebrew scripture after the time of Malachi. So when we're saying why are these books, you know, here, that's that's why the. Now, scribes are the primary way that the, these books had been preserved over time, right? We don't have computer, they didn't have computers to keep digital copies that could be, you know, exactly the same. They had to write them, copy them by hand at the time. We didn't have the printing press either, right? By hand. So these scribes would take a copy and they would literally, letter for letter, <laughs> copy the book, right? all of the books of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, the, oh, hold on one second, I missed the slide. So I wanted to point this out. For, so here, I'm gonna build a timeline of some of these uh, manuscripts, just so it's easier to like picture where these all happened. This goes from 400 BC when the Old Testament, can, Testament canon was solidified, uh, all the way to one of the, one of the later uh, manuscripts that we have, which was somewhere between 1100 and 1200 AD. Um, so there's this group called the Masoretes, and they were around from about 400 to 900 AD. And they uh, were probably the most lauded scribes <laughs> ever, basically, because they were dedicated to preserving the Old Testament scripture. And they, um, they set the standard for accuracy. Th what they did, they did a couple of things. One thing was that the Hebrew language was starting to kind of disappear in the form that it had originally been written down. And in Hebrew, there are no vowels. Uh, everything is a consonant. 
they, they did not bother to write down all the vowels because they said, oh, if I see all these consonants, I know how to pronounce that. I know how to put the, the vowel sounds in the right places. Well, as time went on, people started going, uh, well, we don't actually know how to pronounce this anymore. <laughs> and so the Masoretes did, uh, found a way to try to preserve that for the future. And so they created these accents. And here is a picture of what these looks like. So this is um, a manuscript of, of Hebrew. And everything in the line, these main, these main uh, you know, letters, was there originally. And they felt a, like like religious need to copy them exactly. They felt like we cannot add vowels. That would be adding to the Bible. <laughs> so they felt like, but you know what we can do? Is we can add things above the line to indicate how, what the vowels are and how these should be pronounced. And so they did. <laughs> they added these, these uh, marks above there. And this is how uh, the Hebrew you know, pronunciation was, was maintained. But what's really interesting uh, is that is the way that they maintained accuracy. And I bring this up because I want us to understand the amount of work that through the ages has gone into making sure that our Bible has mean, remained as accurate as possible. What they would do is they would count the number of, of verses in each book. And they would count the number of words in each book. They would count the number of letters in each book, and then they would count the number of times each letter was used. And when they were done with a page, they would check all the counts, and they would, when they were done with the book, they would check all the counts of all those things to make sure that it was identical to what had been written before. That's how much work went into maintaining the accuracy of these. So, yeah, Larry. Yeah, I was thinking of what Jesus said about that. He said, uh, say every yah and tool shall in no wise pass from the law until it's all fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And the tittles was the vowel points. Uh, I looked that up. It's not quite, because the, they didn't have vowels, but it is a part, I can't, let me see. Um, yeah, no, I looked it up. It, that's, that's not what I, what I had learned. Yeah, yeah, it's, the tittle was like, I want to say this is po possibly a tittle, and oh. there was a, like, not, not this part, but, like, there was a, a mark here, and then there's, in some of them, there's a part that juts out, like, right here. I think that's a tittle. See how that juts out just a tiny bit? Oh, it, yeah, I'm sorry. It's hard to, yeah, I can't point at it then. <laughs> Sorry about that. But it's actually part that's, that juts out from some of the letters. Yeah, it's kind of like a serif in our modern font. That's a good way to put it. Just a little mark that comes off the side, yeah. Um, and so uh, the contributions of the Masoretes to the Old Testament the text we have today is so strong, like they've maintained it so well, that we sometimes refer to the text that we have for the Old Testament as the Masoretic text. Because um, they basically set the standard. This is, you know, what was maintained through the, the years. Now, there's an interesting thing because um, until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest manuscripts we had for the Old Testament were, were as old as 800 AD. Now, that should sound horribly late to you, <laughs> right? Because we have tons of, old, of New Testament uh, scriptures that are much, much older than this. So what I'm saying is the oldest Old Testament manuscripts we had were much nearer to us than the oldest New Testament manuscripts we had, which just sounds completely backwards, right? But here's why. The reason is because... Um, the Jews regarded every copy as just as, as legitimate as the copy the, that they were copying from, right? And they also, part of their kind of religious thinking toward the scripture, was that the copies were holy and that when they got old and worn out, they treated them much like we treat the American flag, 
where, you know how we have a ceremony where we burn the flag to, you know, um, there's a word for it, but to end it, you know, um, they would do the same thing with the scriptures. They would either burn them or bury them to like honorably put the old scriptures away, which is why there's not old copies. <laughs> they were on purpose destroyed. And they said, and why? Because the copy we have here is just as good. We haven't lost anything. They didn't feel like they needed to preserve it. Um, so that's, that's why the oldest stuff was here uh, uh, on 800 until the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So then in uh, 1948, in a cave near Qumran, they, um, there was a boy looking for a goat. He went into a cave by the Dead Sea, and he found all these manuscripts. Turns out it was one of the greatest archaeological finds ever. <laughs> um, and uh, the Dead Sea, and here's a, here's a picture of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the Book of Psalms, in fact. And those date back to 100 to 200 BC. So we literally made a jump into the past by a thousand years <laughs> from the oldest manuscripts that we had before when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, so that's a really big deal. And one of the reasons it was a really big deal was because so it had the, the, the original ones they found uh, contained the book of Isaiah and a bunch of other secular works. Okay? The book of Isaiah they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was practically identical to what the Masoretes had written down a thousand years later. So can we have faith that it hasn't changed? <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> that was, it was amazing. Um, so at the, once that was discovered, People went searching around the Dead Sea. Further scrolls were discovered, um, including fragments of almost every book of the Old Testament. And there's still to this day um, a ton of manuscripts they found that they have not like, officially published and has, has been worked through. So they may find even more. Uh, so that's, that's pretty fascinating as well. Um, in total, it was about 200 scrolls. Most of them were fragments but it still was enough to be for us to learn a lot about the Old Testament. Um, all right, then one of the next most important ones is one called the Aleppo uh, Codex. This was formerly the earliest full manuscript of the entire Hebrew Bible that we had, and it was dated between 900 and 1000 BC, or AD, excuse me. Um, the next is one called the Leningrad Codex, um, this was uh, the oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible. Um, it was either that previous, yeah, I think this is our current mo most complete one. The previous one, I believe, had been partially destroyed in a fire after it had been discovered and everything. So we had it and then we lost it, uh, part of it. So it's no longer uh, the oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible. Um, that one was written in Cairo about 1010 AD. Uh, and it is the one that underlies most of the modern Hebrew Bibles, is this Leningrad Codex. Now, there's several other, other manuscripts dating from about 700s to the 900s, but I'm not going to cover them. But these are how we've co compiled our Old Testament. Except, no, so those are, those are from the original Hebrew. We now also need to talk about the translations, because, again, we talked about how the translations are incredibly helpful. The most helpful translation um, is the Septuagint. Uh, and, oh, sorry, the Leningrad Codex is there. There we go. Here we go. So here's, here's a copy of part of the Septuagint. Um, this was the Old Testament translated into Greek. And that happened about 255 BC. So you can see uh, it predates the Dead Sea Scrolls by a bit. Um, the, I'm not sure what the oldest manuscript of it we have is, but that's when it was, it was published, so to speak. Um, this was the first translation of the Hebrew scriptures into another language. Uh, it was translated by 70 uh, Jews, and the word Septuaginta means 70. Um, more Jews could speak Koine Greek than Hebrew during the Second Temple period, which is when this was translated. So if you want, it made sense for there to be a Greek translation. Uh, it probably, 
uh, wasn't written all at once or necessarily by one person. It kind of came about, and there may have even been some competing editions of it, so to speak. But um, it was incredibly influential. It was the, the Bible of the early church. It was the Bible that uh, Jesus used, uh, etc. Like, that's, that's how important it was. The groupings of the Old Testament books into law and history and poetry and prophets came from the Septuagint. Uh, it was in a different order in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and then the subdividing of books into 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, etc., are due to the Septuagint. Um, so that one very much helped elucidate the Old Testament scriptures, especially because we do have manuscripts of it that are much older than the Hebrew ones. So again, we could compare, right? Do these line up? And they did. Um, the next manuscript is, uh, there, there's, an, oh, this, that's not it, uh, the Old Latin, which was from um, 150 AD and was based on the Septuagint. So it was a translation from the Septuagint, which was Greek, into Latin. So it was a translation of a translation. Uh, that one's important. But then the Latin Vulgate, which is what this is, um, is probably the next most important after the Septuagint, as far as its importance to us. It was completed in about 405 AD. Um, it was based on the ancient Hebrew manuscripts, so not a translation of a translation. And it was written before the discovery of uh, most of the Masoretic texts that we know. So, even though the Latin Vulgate is a translation, we have older copies of it than the oldest Hebrew copies we had before the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and uh, this, the, the Hebrew manuscripts, uh, Jerome was the man who, who made the Latin Vulgate. Um, they are, all, the Hebrew manuscripts he used are almost, again, identical to the Masoretic documents we found 600 years later. So again, consistent, 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 <laughs> which is great. A um, couple more, there was, well, there was one called the Aramaic Targums. They were a paraphrases of the Hebrew stories uh, that were written in Aramaic. And then there's one called the Syriac Peshitta. Uh, it was made about uh, from in the 50s AD, and it was trans a translation of the Old Testament into the Eastern Aramaic uh, language, which is known as Syriac. And so since we have all these different translations, we can see, were they consistent? And they were, very much. And so those manuscripts are the foundation for the Old Testament that we have today. And we use all that textual criticism to derive the, New Testament, the Old Testament that we have today. Now, <laughs> moving over, I'm just blazing through because I don't have time. Uh, <laughs> so going on to the New Testament, how do we have that? Book. So unlike the Old Testament, which, which was written over a thousand years, the New Testament was only written in about 50 years. So a really big difference there. And it's obviously much newer than the Old Testament. We know it was mostly letters written in, by inspired men to address churches and individuals. Um, and they were looked at from the beginning as authoritative writings. These were from inspired men. Everyone knew it, and they treated it as such. Uh, they were read with respect publicly, um, which is how we know this. Then those letters were exchanged among the congregations. That means there were copies made, etc. And early on, the oral witness of Jesus was enough. But eventually it wasn't enough if those men uh, and, and women died off. And then, you know, we, they needed it to be written down, so the Gospels were written, right, to record the life of Jesus for posterity. Um, and then, of course, Acts is a natural follow-on to that, uh, we've, and we talked about the, the various reasons it was probably written. Um, regarding the New Testament manuscripts, we have a vast number of them, more than 5,300 manuscripts. Now, most of those are, are um, what's the word? Partial. They're not fragments. fragments. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yes, our fragments. Um, uh, only a few are complete copies of the New Testament together. Now that, here's the thing. It is the best attested book of the ancient world. Number one, bar none, 
We have more manuscripts of the New Testament than anything. The Iliad, the Odyssey, they don't, we don't have as many manuscripts of those things, right? And, and the secular world's like, oh yeah, there's the Iliad, we have it. It's like, as soon as you start talking about the New Testament, which we have wildly more <laughs> manuscripts for, they're like, oh, I'm not sure that's real, you know? <laughs> which shows just how completely bunk uh, the things you read are, right? We know what the Old Testament was at more than any other ancient manuscript. Um, and it shows God's providence. It shows how he is working to make sure that we know what his word is. Now, the groups of manuscripts that we find are broken into three major types. Um, the first one is called Alexandria. Uh, so these are associated with Alexandria and Egypt. Uh, these are represented by, and we'll talk about these manuscripts, the Vatican and Sinaitic uh, manuscripts. These are the earliest manuscripts we have. And so these are considered the best form of the text. They are the oldest, you know, and therefore uh, the ones that show us most likely what was written. Uh, the second is the Western uh, kind of category. These originated in the Western Roman Empire. Um, they are a pretty early form of the text. They have a little bit more paraphrase in them uh, when, when they were copied and or uh, translated. And uh, they have some textual expansions and some weird omissions, which is a, one of the reasons they're not considered as good as the Alexandrian type of, of text. And then the third is a kind called the Byzantine uh, so these were associated with the uh, Byzantine world. That's the Eastern Roman world after Rome was kind of declining, and this is in the, the Middle Ages, so that's much later, right, than the earliest stuff we have. Um, this text type is you know, mainly from later manuscripts. Now, we also categorize these a little bit by what they were written on. <laughs> so we have a decent number that are written on uh, papyri. Uh, these are, this is an example of one of the papyrus uh, kinds. We have about 50 papyri uh, that date from 100 to 400 AD. So that's really, really close, right? I mean, we, we have books that were written potentially in the 90s AD that are in our New Testament. So that's really close uh, to when they were originally written. Uh, 30 of them are from about 100 to 200. So of the 50, that's, most of them are pretty early. Um, these papyri cover in part, some of them in whole, but uh, most of them in part, every book of the New Testament except First and Second Timothy. So we have really early copies um, of basically the entire New Testament, which is uh, fantastic. Now, the second category uh, the, of the manuscripts is vellum. And... Oh, my goodness. Okay, yeah, there's the, oh, do I not have, oh, I guess we'll get to it in a second. I'll show you some pictures of, of them in a, in a minute. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the most important manuscripts. So vellum is what most of these were written on. Um, it is made from animal skin uh, and is usually considered very high quality. Um, and our oldest are complete or almost complete copies of the New Testament. And a lot of these have most of the Old Testament. So the ones that we're about to talk about are the oldest uh, complete Bibles in the world. And they are our main foundation for the New Testament. The first one is the Vatican manuscript. Now, and it's called the Vatican because it's kept there. It wasn't made by the Vatican or anything like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, and um, this dates back to the 4th century, so three to 400 AD. Uh, it is probably the most important witness to the New Testament. Uh, and it's currently in the Vatican Library in Rome. Uh, and it was written in Greek. The second is the Sinaitic manuscript. <clears throat> it is from the middle of the 4th century, so three to 400 AD. It is the oldest complete manuscript of the New Testament that exists today, and it was written in Greek. The next is the Alexandrian manuscript. Oh, yeah, there we go. Alexandrian manuscript here is 4 to 500 AD. 
Um, oops, go back. There we go. It was from the fifth century to four to five hundred A.D. and was written in Greek. Um, and that's all of our vellum manuscripts. But those those ones are the foundation. You know, everything else can help. Like we have a ton of those other manuscripts. We we learn little bits to try to hone in that that those. Um, are the primary sources. The next is we have these things called minuscules. They were much smaller um, uh, manuscripts. Uh, and we, this is where we get the majority of our manuscripts from. Uh, and the late, one of the most important manuscripts comes from 1100 to 1200 AD. Um, we have about 2,800 of them. So this is where the majority of our manuscripts come from, these minuscules. Um, minuscule 1 and 2, which this is uh, a page from minuscule 1. And you'll notice, uh, you probably have already seen, like the, so much work went into these just from what it took to write them to begin with that they, might, they went ahead and just made them works of art. They thought of these not just as a copy of the Bible, like, oh, hey, I've got a copy, I can read it. They thought of them as kind of like the Jews did with how they treated uh, the scriptures. They thought of them as incredibly important, so they put tons and tons of work into them. They made them works of art. And we'll see some in a little bit that are like pushing the bounds of that, where it's, it's remarkable how much effort they put into them. And you can see it's just beautiful, right? Gold leaf and all this stuff. So, um, God, Minuscules 1 and 2 are gospel manuscripts from the 12th century. Um, they were used by Erasmus, who used them to produce the first edited edition of a Greek New Testament. So uh, they also helped build some of the manuscripts that, you know, we use uh, for our New Testament. Now, those were all Greek. Now we're going to talk about a few of the translations. So... There is uh, one called the, the Syriac translation. Uh, Syriac was spoken in Mesopotamia. It, Syriac is almost identical to Aramaic as far as languages go. Um, it was probably the first language the New Testament was translated into out of Greek. Um, there is a manuscript called the Diatessaron. It is the earliest form of the Syriac version. Um, and the reason it's important is because in the 1800s, uh, there were these German scholars who were maintaining that, well, the Gospels couldn't possibly have been written before 140 AD. They're like, there's just, you know, the, manuscript, uh, the manuscripts don't show that it, it could possibly be older than, than that. So they're basically saying it's a lie, right? The Gospels are myth. Um, so uh, they found the Diatessaron, and it... It, there was an Armenian translation that was already in print in the, in the, uh, of the Commentary of Ephraim. The Commentary of Ephraim was written in the 300s, which was based on the Diatessaron, which proved that the Gospels were written earlier than that. And so we, we know from history, you don't get commentary on translations of things uh, until a lot of time has passed, right? People have to accept it. It has to be it takes lots of time to translate. It takes time for those to be distributed and then for people to write commentaries on them, <laughs> right? And so we know it basically proved and shut these German scholars up that, nope, the Gospels could have been written much earlier than, than 140. Uh, so that's, that's why it was interesting. Um, now we have several Latin translations of the New Testament. Uh, the first uh, was the Old Latin uh, it's a, of the Western type uh, the, of those that we talked about. It's less important than the next, which is the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was created in 405 A.D. Uh, we already talked about it a little bit in the Old Testament portion because uh, it was important for the Old Testament as well. Uh, so Jerome translated this. He completed it around 405. Um, it was named the Vulgate at the Council of Trent in 1546 A.D., now, the thing about it is, way before 1546 and before it was considered like the official, um, the official version, Bible of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, it was that it was received by the Christian community almost from the get-go. Like, 
it's not as though the Catholic Church, and this is something you'll hear, right, is that the, the idea is that, oh, the Catholic Church picked the canon and they, they picked the versions and all this stuff. It's like, no, that's not how it worked. The Christian community chose these things. And we'll go into more depth in, into that if I have time, which I'm running out of. Uh, <laughs> so in the 1200s, uh, they had a need for a more easily used Bible, and um, which is, and they took, so what they did is they took the Latin Vulgate, and this man named Stephen Langton, who was a theologian at the University of Paris, arranged the Vulgate into the modern chapter divisions that we still use today. So when you see a chapter, it's Stephen Langton's fault, <laughs> and he did it in the, uh, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. Um, this is probably second only to the Septuagint is the most important translation ever. It literally reigned as the Bible of the Western world for a thousand years. This is the Bible that was read. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And transcript comes from the basis of this. Many of the modern versions do not. Mm, yes. Okay, what they have done is they have taken doctrinal things. If you ever look at the forward mm -hmm. of some of the versions, like the new international version, yeah. if you see more at all contributed to it, you can search through and see places where they actually We will we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I think during a lot of that time period, that was the case. Yeah, the priesthood was the in the Catholic Church was the primary. Yeah, yeah, that didn't happen as much. That is very true. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's see. I'm missing something. Here is a copy. My goodness. This is from an early, uh, this is Codex Ammianatus. Tinnus? I'm getting it wrong, but um, this was produced around 700 AD. This is a copy of the, the Vulgate. It was uh, it weighs 75 pounds and has 10 it has 1,040 leaves in it <laughs> to give you an idea of how these these uh, vellum uh, manuscripts look. All right, so then there's a whole bunch of uh, medieval manuscripts. Uh, they uh, we're, I'm not going to talk about those. There were some other manuscripts. I'm going to mostly skip over these, but I want to show you how beautiful they are because they are considered amazing works of art. This is from the Lindisfarne Gospels. Um, this is an example of the kind of craftsman, work, craftsmanship that went into them. The amount of intricacy here is just spectacular. And then another one kind of along those lines from about 800 AD is the Book of Kells. Uh, you can see uh, the amount of artistry that went into this. I zoomed in just on kind of this area here because I just wanted to show you the intricacy. Um, of all this and they're just beautiful and the colors here this is I mean this is from 800 this thing is over 1200 years old and it's that bright like it's it's pretty uh, impressive oh is that right oh neat yeah I, I thought I had seen it yeah I'll have to look that up uh, I'd heard of that um, now there's this one called the Westcott Hort text. So this, they, they, created, <laughs> they created one called the New Testament in the original Greek. So it was published in 1881 um, by uh, these men named Westcott and, Hort, Westcott and Hort. It was a revised or reconstructed edition of the New Testament based on the best manuscripts that were available uh, at the time. And uh, they... They worked about 30 years on this project to produce this, and uh, it was considered revolutionary for their thoroughness and for the textual criticism uh, techniques that they used. 
and everything. And basically all new editions of, of the biblical text is based on their work. Uh, so if you read a translation today, it probably is based on their work. So, oh yeah. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, so uh, one, one note I want to bring out here is this uh, man named Stepanus, uh, Robert Estienne, released several editions of the Greek text between 1546 and 1551. In his fourth edition, which came out in 1551, that was the first time that the text was divided into verses. So 1551 is when verses showed up. Uh, and his arrangement in the New Testament are the verses that we still use today. So you can blame him if you don't like those divisions. <laughs> um, all right, we have five minutes to cover the canon of the Bible. <laughs> so why are the books that we have considered the book, you know, why are they the books that are in the Bible? Um, we need to note that so the word canon basically means like what is accepted, right? This is the standard. This is the, and everything. Books in the Bible are not canon because we said so. They're canon because God wrote them through inspired men, right? That's, that's why. They had inherent authority because of where they came from. But because we don't have an inspired list from God, we have to do the work of figuring out what do we accept and what do we not accept. And that's what this whole what is canon question comes from. We have to figure that out. Um, the Old Testament canon was established by the time of the New Testament. I'm going to quickly just read a couple of verses. In Luke 24, 44, then he, that's Jesus, said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The um, books in the Hebrew Bible were broken into those three categories, prophets, Psalms, and law. Uh, or the writings is, is uh, what one of them is called. So uh, it lines up with the Hebrew scriptures we have today. Then in uh, Matthew 23, 34 through 35, uh, it says, Therefore, uh, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. The Hebrew scriptures have always been given in a different order than ours. They begin with Genesis, like ours, but they end with 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles is where that story is told. He just said, from A to Z, right? And the A to Z matches the Hebrew scriptures that we have today. Um, the Jewish historian Josephus said in 95 AD in his book Against Appion that there were 22 books in the Hebrew scripture. Those 22 books, because of the way, for example, in the Septuagint, how they're broken up, map to the 39 books we have in our Bible today. So they were established. The Old Testament canon by the time of Jesus was understood. So I'm not going to go into that too much more. New Testament canon, much more complicated. <laughs> so in that one... Um, yeah, here we go. So uh, Justin Martyr, who was a Christian apologist and philosopher from the mid-2nd century, so about 100 to 165 AD, stated that on Sundays in the Christian worship assemblies, the, quote, memoirs of the apostles were read together with the, quote, writing of the prophets. So the church had a canon. <laughs> they knew what was the, uh, the memoirs of the apostles, and they knew things that weren't. Right? They read the stuff that was considered the inspired writings. Um, this is a copy of something called the Muratorian Fragment, uh, which is a Latin copy of a Greek original. It is a list of books that are considered canon. It included all books except Hebrews, James, and First and Second Peter, and possibly Third John. So really, really close to what we have today. Um, then. Uh, in the third century, Origen, who was a Christian scholar and theologian, listed all the books and was, uh, it, it matched exactly, except he was hesitant about Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, and 2 and 3 John. But later in his life, he listed them all without reservation. 
exactly the list we have today. Um, Eusebius, who was a Christian historian in the fourth century, listed all of them, he, but he categorized them, some as universally accepted, uh, some as disputed, but he stated that they were accepted by the majority of Christians. The books in the disputed category was James, Jude, Second Peter, and Second and Third John. And he also had a list of rejected books, and this is something very important too, because you'll hear and you'll see news articles once in a while, oh, we found the gospel of Judas, you know, or something like that. And you're like, oh, Judas wrote a gospel? You know, and it's like, no, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> and even if he had, it wasn't accepted. <laughs> but he didn't. Um, the, the fact is the Christian community was picky. They didn't just take anything anybody wrote. They rejected lots and lots of books as not authoritative because it was obvious they weren't authoritative. So we need to be careful and realize the Christian community was paying attention. You know, We used to be picky. Used to be picky. <laughs> now we read the Gospel of Judas. No, just, um, so what we know is that early, early in the Christian, in the church, there was an understanding of the books that were accepted and those that weren't. They were passed around by the congregations who received them. People took note. There was very little dispute, you know, and the dispute we have is just on a few books that were quickly accepted thereafter. So we can be confident in the New Testament that we have today. Um, I ran out of time. I wanted to talk about our English translations that we have available, so I'm sorry I didn't get to that. Uh, I just ran out of time. But uh, yes, we, need, you know, we have a lot of English translations to pick from. They have various pros and cons. We need to be careful, especially the ones that are closer to, to paraphrases or thought for thought versus you know, word for word. There's good things about those two. They can help us to understand the meaning of, of passages that are harder to understand in a word to word translation. Um, but the fact is, they, we, they're undergirded by uh, these, these manuscripts and these, these techniques we have so that we can be confident in the Bible we have today. So thank you very much for letting me just blaze through all that information uh, today and for your attention for the last nine months and everything. I appreciate it. Um, I should really let us go, Larry. <laughs> Oh, awesome. So those three videos are followed by uh, 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 No. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, that'll be good. They, they cover the whole gamut of it. Oh, very cool. That's great. Yeah, good, good uh, way to learn more. All right, thank you so much. We'll go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for your word and for protecting it for us through all these millennia. And we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your words that sets us free, that allows us to have salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you will bless us as we go into this week and that we will be lights shining in the darkness, sharing your word with others. Please guide us in this and in all things. Thank you for your Son, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.